another thrilling episode of Adventuring Academy. I'm your humble Dungeon Master, Brennan Mulligan. Today, our guest on this, the Dropout Vodcast, where we talk about all things tabletop and how to run games for your friends at your table. The guest you've been waiting for. The time has come. Finally, the mist parts and emerging heroic from the great beyond. We have my friend and yours, you would know him from his work on College Humor Originals as a uh, former cast member, from also having worked on Key and Peele and Adam Ruins Everything, maybe some shows with other Dimension 20 cast members, Ali Beards and Lou Wilson, on the historic improv team, Yeti. You know him as Mavris the Unschooled from Not Another D&D Podcast, as Gorgug, Ricky Matsui, LaPan Cadbury, Cumulus Rocks from Dimension 20, and the creator and game master for the brand new, you gotta check it out, Road Rotating Heroes Podcast, the man, the myth, the legend, your friend and mine, Mr. Zakoyama! <sighs> ah! <laughs> wow. What a glowing introduction. Hi. Um, <laughs> thank you for having me. Uh, it, a, a long time coming. Uh, uh, delighted to have you here. Finally, my friend, Zach. We made it happen. We made it happen. Dude, rotating heroes. Incredible, phenomenal. With, again, friends of the show, uh, uh, Siobhan Thompson, Emily Axford, and Mike Trapp. Holy yes. shit. I, I think the, the audience here would know those three people. Uh. <laughs> I, fair, fair to assume that we are talking yeah. about individuals that would be known to everyone listening. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, Talk to me about Rotating Heroes, man. It's oh. goddamn phenomenal. Uh, from whence did this idea come and what has the experience been like uh, getting this brand new adventure up off of its feet? Let me let me get into it. Let me tell you all about it. Uh, <laughs> um, well, you know, I, you know, Brennan, of course, is uh, the person who has shepherded me through my D&D &D world, uh, my career in D&D &D, and just playing it all together. Um, and from just playing D20 and playing with my friends in NADPOD and uh, having some free time, I was like, it would be fun to, to do a D&D &D actual play pod. And in trying to figure out ways to do it, like kept running into the fact that I want to play with, you know, a bunch of friends. I'd love to play. I don't think that um, in, in figuring out what would make sense for me, uh, it, it felt difficult to lock down a group of people who would be just in to 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 be like the solid crew for the entire time uh it's a big commitment to do something like that just ongoing forever or you know however long a podcast lasts but uh that coupled with just like having a lot of friends i want to introduce to D, &D and play D, D with uh led to the idea of like let's just rotate heroes in and out and um, that's where you get the name, the Rotating Heroes Podcast. Hell yes. Um, uh, first of all, I can't tell you how much I vibe with that. Obviously, like Dimension 20 and, you know, like I feel like as the the Dungeon Master for Dimension 20, I got the best of both worlds by getting to play with the core cast who are some of my closest friends in the entire world and who have a chemistry that I feel like is unrivaled. Uh, but definitely also uh, uh, have been able to like do these side quests where we get to uh, spotlight, A, have people that are big in the D&D space come in and we all throw down together and have a great time. And then also take some people that maybe haven't ever played D&D &D before and throw them up into the spotlight or take people mm -hmm. that maybe a college humor audience doesn't recognize uh, and throw them into the spotlight. Um, uh, yeah, the, rotate, the idea of rotating heroes, very, very cool. I feel like with Dimension 20, I get to sort of have the cake and eat it too. And yeah, eat it too, baby. And, and you eat it too, baby. <laughs> you can't just uh, have the cake. You gotta eat it too. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, like, it's, d d is so interesting in that it is fun to play with people who are really experienced, and it's also a lot of fun to, to show people the game for the first time. Uh, that, I think we all tap into that side of it as well. Because it is that kind of thing where you just want to share it. Yeah, the, the, the high of, like, giving the game to other people is very, very real. Um, uh, has there been... Uh, outside of, because we obviously are part of a long running home game that for pandemic reasons, we haven't picked up in a long, long time, but you know, yearly Christmas time cabin trips to play with the crew. Um, uh, how, how much D and D just for like 
uh, curiosity's sake, how much D and D have you played off recorded, like like non recorded? Yeah, well, um, I'll give you all of it. Um, our home game. One time, Lou DM'd for me, you, and a couple of other friends of ours. Very fun. Love that. And then that. that we did a little bit of a Zoom game with Lou DMing for us, uh, us and our friend Jason. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was also very fun. We only we have only done a couple of sessions with that. Um, and then outside of that, I believe you are the only people that have DM'd for me outside of a show. Like, because outside of you, you and Murph are the only other DMs I know. You, Murph, and... Well, actually, you, Murph, Emily, and Lou have, have been the only DMs I know. <laughs> so we're keeping it in the family, baby. We are keeping yeah. it in the fam. But I had... I tried to DM... I've, I've done it literally twice before doing the podcast. So wow. uh, it was kind of... And, and also one session with each group of people. And yeah, it is the lion's den, baby. We have been thrown in. <laughs> we have thrown ourselves in by just <laughs> very Lorax move to throw yeah. yourself in. Um, I've uh, made this situation for myself. <laughs> um, and I gotta tell you, it's fun, but a lot. It's overwhelming to DM. Um, what were because here's here's the funny thing right one of one of the reasons i'm very like i am very unsurprised that rotating heroes is as good as it is because it's um, immediately out of the gate excellent is there are a lot of skills that are it's not like the only way to get dming skills is by dming Mm -hmm. the years of doing improv the years of writing the years of performance like all of that is immediately usable which is why i don't think people should be intimidated by straight you you don't need to log like five years as a player character before you dare attempt your first time like running uh, exactly if um, anything i feel like i waited too long you know honestly yeah because also in the same way like i feel like uh um I one of the biggest moments for me in terms of just like, you know, UCB and doing improv uh, was coaching. I started coaching, which I like it was one of those things that you wait a little bit of time till you feel like you've earned the, the credit to be able to do it. When I started coaching, I immediately improved as a performer. And I feel like Another DMing, thing that I feel like hesitant, I've been way too hesitant to do now. I now I feel like I'm I, I don't see myself doing a lot of coaching these days. Uh, even if I w- decided I would uh, be ready to coach. Uh, yeah. A hundred no, percent. Similarly, again, a, th- a thing that I think people go like, you know, am I, am I ready for, for that leap? And almost always, yes, you are. Like you do have a perspective to offer. You do have a voice as a dungeon master, as a storyteller. Um, and what does ready mean? Like, that's what I, that's what I've had to come to terms with. Like, am I going to be a perfect dungeon master? No. And (laughs) that's, that's the struggle. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And I think there's that element too, that people kind of put a pressure on themselves where they're like, I'm going to like, what, yeah. What does readiness constitute? Because if you're waiting until it's like, I'm going to wait until I am so good at this skill that I won't fail. And it's sort of like, you're going to wait until you're, good at a skill to start to learn the skill like yeah, you can't do it unless you do it exactly. <laughs> so, yeah um but let's talk about that because again uh uh jumping into it and doing it so you 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 dm once or twice jump into doing rotating heroes very much that thing of it's very fun but yeah it does ask a lot of you um uh my point of view knock it out of the park uh, uh, episode one of Rotating Heroes is phenomenal. People should go subscribe to the Patreon and check it out. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is um, having been someone who logged a ton of player experience, I would assume that there are a lot of things that aren't surprises just because you've played the game so much. Was there any element of it that was actually surprising that you were like, actually, my experience on the other side of the screen did not prepare me to anticipate X or Y? Yeah. So I think I still have a long way to go in terms of if I create an encounter and then have people, you know, run people through the encounter, um, I'm almost always wrong about how I think 
uh, how difficult I think it will be. Uh, or, you know, it's like either extremely easy or um, uh, like the, the fear of killing your players is very, very huge for me. Um, so like, yeah, gauging that stuff has always been uh, or it has so far has been pretty difficult, I think. Um, like, I think it's like you're saying, like anyone, you don't have to be a master DM to like come up with cool scenarios. Like if you've seen a movie or whatever, you can like, yeah, like there's a set piece that's fun and like translating that into an encounter and then being able to judge how difficult it is. That's what's tough to me. Yeah. I feel that in a big way. I feel that there's like, even to this, like like no shade to any of the designers of the various editions of D&D. It's a tremendously hard job, but like challenge rating really will not help you determine the difficulty totally. of an encounter. Um, and, you know, I can't, there's, there's a certain point too where depending on the size of the party, like for example, rotating heroes like NADPOD has three person cast. When I design for Dimension 20, which is a six person cast, I can never make a challenge hard enough. Like at a certain level, especially. Yeah. Um, it's like, how do you make, you know, I remember um, on on paper, you know, spoilers for our very lethal season, A Crown of Candy, but like in the episode both, you know, where, uh, you know, again, two spoilers, where LePan dies, that encounter, um, on paper, like if you run that through an encounter calculator of how hard that cathedral fight is, uh, on paper, that should have killed you guys like 20 times over. It yeah, should've... exactly. That is, <laughs> it's very funny how immediately on, uh, yeah, like I, like you're saying, it's very hard to gauge, but the, the challenge rating stuff is like, uh, there, there are these thresholds of like easy, medium, hard, deadly, or whatever it is. Yeah. Like how immediately you hit deadly, and then there's no gauge from there. <laughs> so it's like, well, this is I don't know. And what does deadly really mean? And yeah. like, because that's the thing is, even in that encounter in the cathedral, uh, you know, one different die roll has everybody get out of that encounter just fine, right? Totally. Like, uh, uh, so how deadly was it really? And trying to figure that stuff out is I think like encounter design is a huge challenging part of this and the converse of it, which is like, you know, spoilers for this uh, recent season of Unsleeping City chapter two. I've, I've been doing this since I was 10 years old. I was certain that that clown on the parade balloons <laughs> encounter was gonna, was gonna be a knockdown drag out brawl. And it, those clowns were for lack of a better word clowns. They yeah. really, we fucking dunked on those clowns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's impossible. It's just impossible to to that that's and I think with the podcast I I've I put a lot of pressure on like trying to make unique scenarios for like they've there's only been like like one and a half to uh traditional fights in the first arc. Mm -hmm. And so it's like uh especially when you create mechanics that are like slightly less than like the normal fight, it gets confusing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, so that's, uh, uh, that's an interesting thing to get into is like when you're thinking of an encounter, like obviously the mechanical element of like, is this going to be challenging or not? Which by the way, my advice is that most DMs I think are in, in the same point of view of, really worrying about killing their players. And I think, especially with 5e, with death saving throws, there are a lot of stop gaps built in. It's less deadly than you think it is. Like okay. the game in general is less deadly than you think it is. Like I would always say, make it a little harder would be my thing. Because in the times that I've PC'd, um, encounters that are constructed by the books, I quickly know when I'm a PC in them, there is no world where we don't emerge totally unscathed from this. <laughs> there, is, there is no world where we don't emerge totally unscathed. Like, I'll, it'll be a miracle if anyone even drops. You know, like... Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, I got, I, I'm too precious with my babies. And um, sometimes you gotta let your babies just wander around outside. Kill them. Fucking kill them. Um... <laughs> 
Hey, don't talk about my babies like that. Um, uh, no, but they really will most of the time, especially in high level play, like low level play, first level. Yeah. You can TPK a first level party pretty easily, but high level play good. By the time your players get to like 10th, 11th, 12th, especially up to like the really higher levels. Good fucking luck. What are you going to do? They have like wish spells and shit. You're really, yeah. oh, you're going to kill somebody. They have like mass cure wounds and tr it's like, what do you want to revivify? You want to raise dead? You want like, what are we, what's the threat How level? How often are you aware of your player's spells? Uh, like, I mean, I, I feel like um, that's to me an interesting thing to take into account just because like some characters can change your spells daily or whatever, but like uh, how much of that is a factor with what you plan? Oh, it's incredible. And to, to that reason, there's nothing to screw your shit up like a cleric or a druid, right? <laughs> like, for real, the, the, yeah. the, the, the spellcasting classes that can change their prepared spells on a dime from their entire spell list, whoo, that yeah. is wild. Like, the, the easiest spellcasting classes to account for are, number one, probably you have your known spells. So like your warlock, your sorcerer, your, yeah. you know, it's like your bards where it's like, these are the spells I have and I can't change them till I level up again, right? Then there's wizard, which, yeah, they can switch their spells around, but limited to the spell book they have, which you yeah. as a DM can at least have some familiarity with. Clerics and druids, what the hell? It's like... <laughs> You know, they level up and it's like, are you going to go through, like go to D&D &D Beyond and look through every single spell of that new level and be like. They're all um, so in, like nuts and different. Like, and different. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's a huge one. Um, but I would say, yeah, like even what, what level are your PCs starting at and rotating? So humans? they are there. I believe they end the arc at five. Um, cool. Yeah. So that's like not too high, but uh, it's certainly not first level. Like, you know, they can do some stuff. They can do some damage. Um, uh, tra trap in particular, that I won't spoil it, but like does something in, in the last episode of the arc that I was like, oh, this fucked me. This is, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 why would I have seen this? Why would I have seen this? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, those those creative those creative uses of those spells are really hard. And that's the thing with spellcasters is every once in a while they'll pull something out and you just have to give it to them. There's no there's no like Okay guys, yeah, you win. <laughs> you beat me up. You just beat me up. Ah! Uh oh, it's a beautiful <laughs> It's a beautiful, beautiful feeling to to have you inducted into this this cohort of dungeon masters. Uh, I remember listening to the, again, I've mentioned this a couple times before, but listening to the first thing, you going into this awesome lore dive about the world and this cool world building around the obelisk and the sort of town and industry that have grown up around it. And you give one name of a, of a bit of world building in your <laughs> world and the players just immediately go berserk, derail the session and start dunking on you. Look, it's called the wafting and it's pretty <laughs> scary. So. Yeah, and they are fucking called corn gremlins. And at the end of the day, <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're corn cuties, though. It's God not, damn it, I, to dude. differ from your point of view, <laughs> yeah, that's you where you lost this, me. Now. You know the sting, and yet you still demand to call them corn cuties. How could you? Um, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very you know, it's very funny to 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 be on that other side of stuff. Um, so, like, knowing that these PCs are going to throw these curveballs at you, um, what has the process been, like, what is the part that has come the most naturally to you between, like, in between encounter design, which is a very mechanics-oriented thing, world design, which is very much just, like, creative writing, and then sort of the actual meat and potatoes of, like, narrating through scenes, improvising dialogue. Like, of those three kind of spheres, what's your experience been with each of them? Uh, sorry, so it's uh, dialogue, the world itself, and mechanics. Mechanics, I think, are the hardest for me to to manage, just because yeah. like uh, 
and coming up with them, I, I rarely, I, I don't think I have a good system for testing them, if that makes any sense. Sure. Um, and then w the world building is just fun. I, 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 have, I, have, I just feel like that, like I'm getting into the second arc now and it's, uh, it's been very fun to like, just sit and think about what it could be. Uh, so that, that is like, just also there's the pressure of just wanting it to be good, but like generally, um, I think that's just enjoyable. Uh, the the more improv -y scene work kind of stuff, I feel like I am surprised that I, I find it harder than uh, I would like for it to be. Certain things about it are, are easy, like, you know, like basically when there's like a gamey event, you know, so like when someone comes up to your, your stall as a storekeeper or whatever, and they like ask for something stupid and then you're just in an improv scene and you're like what are you talking you know like that yeah. you can really lock into that dynamic pretty well um and i find that really fun i just like uh i think it's hard for me to make sure that i allow like as a when you have a show making sure that the time is under consideration that i think i would love to have the experience of doing this without time being a factor because yeah. that is the the thing that makes everything hard. <laughs> oh, a million percent. The clock yeah. is what makes it a, for lack of a better word, like when we're doing Dimension 20 shoots, like the fun of D&D &D is completely there, but the clock is what makes it a job. Like yeah. the thing of like, ha, 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 cool, cool, cool. Anyway, so tick, 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 tick. Right, gotcha. Um, there's a whole bunch of crew people here. They're manning the cameras. There's a whole bunch of, you know, like. Yeah that's a whole added element to all of it that does make it very, very challenging. Um, but that's so interesting, of the, the idea of the, because obviously done a ton of writing, done a ton of performing. So like the world building session prep stuff is just sort of joyous and fun. But it is interesting because like, I feel like you obviously have a long history through of doing improv. And of course there are parts of improvising through a session of D&D that are almost exactly like doing a long form comedic improv scene. Um, but obviously my experience is like, I was doing D&D way before I got on stage and was doing mm -hmm. comedic improv. Um, uh, like that stuff is, it, it's very, very interesting especially if you came up in like a UCB system where we're told so often, don't go for plot. Like they yeah. literally say like, don't follow plot. Is that something that you've been able to kind of plug into your improv muscles of like, yes, do a funny scene, make a strong character choice, do all that shit we've been trained to do, but also advance story. Like how is that? Yeah. Well, I've always taken issue with don't follow plot because I find that my favorite improv scenes are scenes where you are um, maybe not the, the fun of it is the plot, well, well, I guess that, like, what I find frustrating about that sentiment is that, like, certain scenes can have a game that is fueled by a plot. You know, like, uh, if you have a very specific genre scene, it can feel very plotty. Like, the game moves can be plotty, if that makes sense. Right. That makes sense. And for, for our audience watching at home, this this advice about improv is basically just due to... The, the fact that like a lot of people come into improv for the first time with storytelling rules very firmly ensconced in them about like conflict is good and necessary because it advances drama. Those don't necessarily work on this for the type of like game-based comedy scenes that like mm. an improv theater is gonna be looking for where we say like, if you tell a story, you might not be repeating the funny behavior. Another way to think about it actually is like when you watch TV, prestige dramas like Breaking Bad or The Sopranos or whatever, or Game of Thrones have a plot. Sitcoms, which focus on comedy, fundamentally, like the, the most classic of them, Simpsons or Seinfeld or whatever, return to status quo at the end of every episode. Totally. Like, nothing advances. Um, yeah, like uh, this is a, when you said Breaking Bad, like an example for me would be like, I don't know. This guy uh, is doing Breaking Bad with hot dogs. He's uh, he figured out how to make hot dogs in a weird way. Uh, that's a funny game. Uh, to use plot to fuel that would be like, oh, this guy is actually the the drug kingpin for hot dogs around here, and so he's mad at you for this 
science teacher for making the hot dogs the way. <laughs> and so that's plot, but but you're using it to get to the right. the game of why are these guys doing hot dogs like drugs? Yeah, <laughs> but you shouldn't seek to avoid plot because your second beat could very much be a plot move of going, hey, the you know the Nathan's Corporation is sending hired goons to come and kill you because your rival hot dog stand is threatening their global, and now there's a gunfight and yeah. you know yeah exactly that you can you, know. you can find the the ways to intertwine them yeah yes 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 absolutely. Um, well, that's rad as hell. So how many, like you're saying that you're, you're wrapping up arc one now. Um, uh, I don't want to like make spoilers for rotating heroes. No worries, yeah. Um, how intertwined are the various arcs going to be? Is it same campaign world? Are we going totally different universes? Or, and if we're same world, is it kind of a connected plot element or not? So yeah, there's just like a, a good question and like, I'm finally at the point where, you know, after five episodes and going on to the second arc, and this is going to be the way that we prove the concept of the podcast. And after thinking about it, like, I think I can reserve the right to do either. But Ooh. for this first, uh, for this first arc, um, we're, we're taking a little bit of the LaRonde approach. So Mike Trapp is going to continue on, uh, with two new characters. So uh, for for this second arc, it's going to be my trap with my buddy Jacob Waisaki and Allie Beardsley. And so like it's a them on a him continue on following a clue about something into into a new area, and then either one of them or maybe uh, fully new characters take over um, uh, the next arc with within that same world. Uh, and maybe playing against some of the same uh, forces of evil or whatever. Fascinating. Very LaRonde, very macro yes. scene in a way, like following a character to a new part yes. of a location. Um, uh, ooh, love that. Um, the the idea there too of like following that character out does make the world feel a lot more like connected. Also, love reserve the right. Gotta mm -hmm. reserve the right. <laughs> Because, like, it. yeah, I mean, uh, I if I, I have nothing without my rights, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't let everyone win. I can't let everyone win. No, uh, of course not. And no one should expect that of you. Um, <laughs> well, let me also ask in that case, um, uh, going into like do this next arc, because I feel like we have a lot of people that watch the show that are, again, like have a lot of player experience, but going into your new thing, like, because you've recorded a couple episodes for arc one and it feels like even though you're like, oh, I'm like getting up on the ball, this is brand new experience, that there already are a bunch of very practicable lessons that you're like, hey, one arc of this Rotating Heroes thing and I already know what I want to do next time. Yeah. Um, what are the big takeaways for you as you're going into this second arc? Because I think we probably do have, I think there's a lot of people that try DMing once they have some criticism of themselves about what they're doing. What is the stuff for you that you're like, oh, I can immediately put this into action on the next go around? Good question. I feel like, like you said earlier in this episode, like I can, uh, I can be a little harder on them. Um, that was a, a, a big challenge with the first one. It's just because it's like, well, it's also ruins the show if I kill everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. like and so like that is a weird dynamic to be also scared of uh but that that can at times make it less interesting for sure and so i i have that that's like the main lesson i think uh and then also with the clock being a factor um i i just want to make sure that i allow space for things to breathe um because I, I feel like I get into this sort of rushing mentality with this, you know, as inter D and D as entertainment versus at home, like where it can go as long as you have set aside time for, and it gets to wherever it gets to, uh, to be battling the clock. I felt like in listening to myself, cause I edit it, uh, you know, I, I edit the final pass of it. Like, uh, I hear myself rushing everyone, which I don't love to, to do. And that, I think that problem leads to less character exploration uh, and wanting to make sure that we explore the characters uh, by giving them room to breathe and talk to each other. Yeah. Well, 
damn man that's like yeah. i feel like you just hit a deep vein within D D storytelling kind of on either side of the divide and to to branch out a little bit now because in all of the every pc you've played in all of the d20 campaigns has found some huge vein of emotional resonance with fans of the show like there are people who have gotten quotes of the Gorgug quote from sophomore year tattooed on their body. Shout out to really those people. Truly wild, truly wild. Amazing, uh, amazing. Uh, amazing. Of like, it's Gorgug, keep going. Yeah. Um, uh, LaPan Cadbury with the absolute mic drop line <laughs> of the campaign, um, uh, episode six. And Ricky Matsui, one of the most beloved characters, also an impressive feat to pull off of a character who is very much in that Superman mold of like, I am here to help. I am a classic, almost mythological hero of like, I'm here to be heroic. We're not going grim dark. He's not an edge lord. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm a good-hearted person who's come here to help. What you're talking about is, I think, one of the most classic things of. It's actually true in home games to a certain degree as mm -hmm. well. Even when you don't have the ticking production clock, what does it look like to take time to just develop character? And you have a lot of experience from that now, not only as a DM, but through having played so many deeply resonant characters. Like when you're playing in a D&D campaign, how do you take that shot? How do you take the called shot to be like, actually, I'm gonna step into the spotlight for a second and I'm gonna do a solo. I'm gonna build my character here for a moment. Yeah. It's absolutely necessary. Totally, I, I, it's, it's so necessary. And I think uh, to give that space I, I, I'm, I'm learning how to figure out how to tee that up in a way that's not, uh, not, I, I, I'm not too worried about it being obvious, but like not to me just forcing it, you know what I mean? Like, uh, to, to make it feel organic and make them, make it come from them, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that's just, I, I wish I had a better answer to that other than like, I want to make sure that I don't rush them through stuff. Uh, that's what that's what I think I the lesson I learned from the first thing to to go into the second arc. Oh man, I mean like well here's a sh shout out to there's a million and one things that I think Matt Mercer does as the DM for Critical Role that are just mind blowingly good. The guy is a, a ge genius is an understatement. The guy's a, a, a master of the craft and. One of the things that he does so well and that Critical Role as a show does so well is doing these like campfire scenes. It's like, hey, we're taking watch. Two characters by a fireside who maybe haven't interacted before and we're just gonna watch and see them talk about whatever shit matters to them, which I watch those scenes and just salivate because we like Dimension 20 is just a very different show. We don't, we don't yeah. take 20 minutes to have a scene where it's like, just spill your heart out. It's yeah. like, it's like, baby, Rick Perry made one hell of a battle set and we got to get there in 40 minutes. Let's go. Let's fucking go, baby. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so, which again, I feel like there's a whole skill involved in doing that as well of, of like keeping things moving in that kind of fast. And again, that's sort of like part of the comedy college humor brand of Dimension 20 is that we, our pace is a little bit fast, but Watching those moments where like those people just like sink into character is so goddamn cool. And every moment of the Dimension 20 cast as well of finding those moments within the bits and banter, within the yeah. crazy shenanigans is uh, really special, special and spectacular to me to watch you guys find those moments. Um, yeah. And you do a, such a great job of like um, empowering us to make those moves, I think. And I think that is something that feels uh, important for me to remember going into this next arc is like, I don't want you to feel like you're stressing me out if you tell your story. <laughs> you <know? laughs> that I mean, it's a hard thing, but I yeah. think it's, that's something as a DM, it's, the, it's, it's a very hard lesson to learn, mm -hmm. which is fundamentally, yeah, like you did all the prep work and you made the world up and you did all this stuff, if this was a movie, the names on the marquee would be the PCs and yes. just fucking eat that. That is what it is. That's what you're yeah. here to do. That's the job. And like, if you are, if 
if if you had the coolest encounter in the world and the best world design and all this shit and you were so into your own idea that you smothered the fire of who your PCs are and why we care about them. Surprise, you told a bad story. You yeah. told a bad story sure. and all your work was completely fruitless. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just, I mean, like if there's any message to give to like DMs who are considering starting, your job is to support the story of those player characters. Um, so in all those moments, like, like sure, I'm trying to think of, of how easy, if you were a DM that had your head up your butt, would you look at like season one Gorgug asking people if they're his dad and be like, well, this doesn't advance the plot at all. <laughs> and it's like people's no, favorite yeah. thing from the season. There's like the, the compilation of Gorgug asking different people if they're his dad is like one of the first fan compilations that the show ever had. Like it's it's one of those things of of like, no, that is like the opposite of a waste of time. It's like looking at the cherry on top and be like, well, well this isn't central to the confection. <laughs> like, no, it's the cherry on top. There's a it's pit in that. Why do we, <laughs> what are we gonna even do with that? I can't put that whole thing in my mouth and eat it and swallow it. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, and, it, and it does feel like uh, a lesson that, you know, was at top of mind going into the first arc, but now is more apparent going into the second arc to me personally. And like, um, I, I mean, I'm just excited to 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 keep that tenet in mind of just like tell their story, don't don't tell your story. <laughs> it's but it's again, it's it's very challenging because there's yeah. I think some DMs, it's like it's a very hard needle to thread because the thing is. You you do have to make a plot. You have to make villains. You have to make sense because you want to do those things that are going to give your heroes the world to interact with that will make them heroic. But yes. it's it's so there is that there's like that old Ginger Rogers quote where someone asks her like, Ms. Rogers, what was it like dancing with the great Fred Astaire? And she was, I think it looks somewhat, uh, you know, she sort of quipped back like everything that guy did, I did backwards and in high heels. And it was one of those things of like that moment of uh, what you're kind of doing as a dungeon master is trying to tap dance backward and in high heels is to like throw up these villains and throw up these encounters, yeah. centering the actions of this like, uh, other thing and that's where the skill really comes in how much can you center their activity looking at, at the dimension 20 seasons as well um uh spoilers for the most recent or it won't by the time this airs it won't be the most recent but as of shooting this the most recent episode of dimension 20 which was i think one of the best things that other pcs do and something that i think is very special but in terms of that idea of like how do you have character moments and growth and stuff like that you know there's this whole scene of Siobhan as Iga Lazowski going into the dragon chest and meeting Smoch Matka, meeting the dragon mother at the heart of the chest and freeing her and finding this New York City egg and giving it to Kingston. Mm -hmm. It's like a 40 minute scene. It's a long scene. And it's a scene that four out of the six PCs aren't present for. And even Kingston who's there with her is being extremely respectful because of how much this is about Iga's heritage and and her magic and this thing she's discovering about the history of her family and her world. Um, and I think that there's an element in that scene of looking at how much every other person is excited to give Siobhan like the spotlight in that yeah. moment. I, I think that's how uh, I think we get we get spoiled by by our, our friends and how talented they are. It's it's very funny to like. Um, I think that's why Dimension Twenty is so fun. Is just that how um, how much we like each other's work and how I think this is. I mean, this isn't exactly what you're saying, but just that 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 at times we can be really economical with our storytelling and like have like short burst that like that fit into everything but but yeah like we we all were cool to just like sit there and watch that 40 minute scene you know because it's like i final i'm curious about what's going going on with them like i've i've been wondering what's going on there so uh Hell yeah. part of the show for us and i think that uh, that too is sort of an integral part of that is if you there are DMs that worry about sharing spotlight between players. And I think one of the interesting things is 
having this idea of like at all moments, every character must feel involved is actually a great way to leave everyone kind of feeling like that, that sort of compromise ick, that kind of feeling of like, well, I'm, I'm never really getting a full bite at the apple. Like everything has to be me equally meaningful to all of us. And I've always been much more of the idea that it's, it's kind of better to like trade it off. Yeah. You gotta like, get that QT in the quality time, you know, <laughs> exactly that. We're going to take this moment to focus on this character and what they're dealing with that. Now we're going to spend a moment here in this scenes about what you're going through. And that's going to feel very good. And that I think, you know, I hear a lot of campaigns that seem to work that way of like, you know, even an entire arc it's like, Oh, for the next five sessions, all of us are helping one PC get revenge on their nemesis. Is this fundamentally going to feature this PC and their emotional reality a little bit more than everyone else? Maybe, but I know that the arc after that, we're going to return the favor. And it's, I think that's just a better way of kind of like managing that stuff. Um, when you are, when you're playing in like a longer campaign, obviously like Dimension 20's longest campaign is like 18 episodes, but like uh, uh, you're playing a longer campaign. I'd also be interested in hearing about like with Maverick the Unschooled, who obviously kind of became the main character of his own <laughs> side quest, Hot Boy Summer. So sure. so funny. Yeah. Um, when like, do you feel that spotlight moving to you and go like, cool, now is actually a time for me to like, insert some character exploration, this will not be a waste of time. Even if it's completely non-plot advancing, this is a necessary element of the story or it's a necessary bit because it's just going to be funny. Like, do you feel that moving on you? Do you feel those opportunities coming and seize on them? And if so, like, what's your, like, like how do your instincts sort of get that trigger effect as you're playing in a longer campaign? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I mean, I think like an improv muscle that we've talked about is like, yeah, you know, you can pass the focus around and we all like kind of internally understand that. Um, and like, it would be, it would feel really strange if you just like either went too hard in one direction or the other uh, to make it all about you or make it not about you at all. Um, and I, I think like to back to the clock, I guess I would say uh, it's that sometimes I, I, I think I feel hesitant to do it just in terms of, of time. Uh, and that's, I think if anything, I, I'm a person who is weird about attention. I think is a strange thing about me is that like, I don't know that I love, so much attention and, and focus on me. So like, I usually am trying to be a little economical with what I'm doing. <laughs> um, and for, for it to, for Mavris to, to have like so much focus on him for that whole arc was a very strange change of pace where it was just like, it's very bizarre to be that, um, uh, almost gratuitous with uh your with your time which is uh, i don't know i mean i think it was um definitely incredibly fun though to like explore that side of the coin um but yeah i think you just sort of naturally feel the ebb and flow of the way that the session is going where it's like yeah we kind of did uh fabian's thing we kind of did a dine add-ons thing we you know it feels like i just know that gorgug would be trying to make a satellite right now that's what we're gonna uh, focus on. Yeah. That's like a perfect example of the kind of thing that's like, we like, yeah, we need that. And if, if the void, it, like you're saying, I know that people, especially again, people playing home games that watch the show, like they will feel that thing of like, Oh, do I really want to like derail to go make a satellite right now? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's the story. You, we have to have your chapter too. You've got to add your ingredient to the soup or yeah. this doesn't work. And even if it's like for that to me was like, yeah, even if this is not like a super long scene for Gorgug, it's still happening. And we all need to know that this is happening. Uh, and whether it's uh, so far, it's so present, like we don't need to watch him doing it for like three hours, but like that it's still a lot of, it's almost montage color to the show. 
Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, no, I love that. It's a, that that's a, yeah, uh, and I would say too, as a, just advice to everybody, like one of my favorite things is like coming from season one going to now is the degree of comfort that the Dimension 20 cast has asking for scenes to happen of being like, I'm gonna go talk to this NPC or I'm gonna go check in on this of like taking that initiative to ask for stuff is so helpful, it's huge as a DM. Because again, stories are so much more satisfying when they are driven by the wants and desires and actions of the protagonists. Like, it's always gonna be better if the PCs are hunting down the bad guy themselves, rather than like, okay, we defeated the last thing, let's wait and see what the DM's next plot hook is. Like, yes. always better to just, you guys be directing the action. Dying for that. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I love that. It makes DM's life a lot easier. Um, uh, uh, speaking of directing the action, I say we turn it over to uh, our great viewers and watchers uh, who have questions for us. Uh, these are submitted on the Dropout Discord. Thank you so much for submitting these questions. Um, first question from Smallest Brown. Thanks, Smallest Brown. Hi, Zach. The Rotating Heroes pod has been a blast so far and a great take on making actual play podcasts easier to jump into. What made you want to start on this project and what made you want to see it through? Oh, the follow through. Um, thank you, Smallest Brown. Um, well, it's, yeah, like you're saying, follow through. Like, it's been an idea that I've had for a while uh, and it's been, you know, challenging to to like jump into it for the reasons that i was talking about earlier in the podcast of just like yeah am i ready to be a dm for a podcast i've done it twice whatever <laughs> is this going to be a, a disaster uh so that that's like the fear going into it but like eventually just hit a point where it was just like i i don't really have any excuse not to right now I, everything that i come up with is just kind of an excuse to to delay it and like uh and i and at the end of the day it's just like a fun thing to do with friends and just like focus on the fact that you're doing this because it's fun and that's that will help you power through any sort of anxieties or insecurities you have about it i think um so that helped me a long way just to like just focus on the fun of it Ooh, focus on the fun i love that uh, perhaps perhaps that's the episode title right there <laughs> um uh, love that um uh, uh, I totally agree. I think that there's like, um, picking up a big project can be really, really daunting. E even a home game is a large production. It's getting mm -hmm. the people together. It's getting the schedules together. Um, but keeping a focus on the joy, the reward that waits at the end of that task, uh, I think is a great thing to set your sights on. Um, uh, um, uh, this next one comes to us from Kayla Bella. Thanks, Kayla Bella. Um, Zach, as a newer DM, how do you balance telling the story you set out with versus letting the PCs influence the world? I've DM'd a handful of times and I worry I don't give them enough push and pull in the world around them. Parenthetical, shout out to the Ziscord. Ooh, <laughs> the Ziscord. Yes. The Ziscord is the Discord that, uh, that came from my Twitch channel. Um, haven't been streaming too much lately, mostly because of this podcast, but, um, uh, it's still pretty active and there's, uh, people discussing rotating heroes in there, but, um, I, yeah, the push and pull, I mean, it's a lot of what we've been talking about. is just like, um, I going into the arc was like, well, basically it's a fun factory with different challenges throughout and had that kind of railing to kind of guide me and, I think a, a, another challenging thing for me was like, how much of the story do I dole out here, even when they're pressing on it? You know, uh, it feels like this is a thing that I want to reveal later. You know, that that can be a weird uh, energy to figure out. Um, but how do I? Yeah, the balance is just something that like I think you learn as you go, and that's how I felt at least, where I was like, okay, this. I gave them more room in this episode. The second episode, I listened back and I was like, I guess I didn't really give them that much room. Uh, and so you just kind of have to like be kind to yourself and let like the times when you don't do it be okay. And the times that when you do it, uh, well, when the times you don't do it be okay. And then like that informs the next time you do it. 
Yeah, I think that like learning from the process is the name of the game. Yeah. And I, I used to tell that to beginning improv students when they would talk, like a class show went badly and they were like, oh, well, this is the end of the world. And you're like, no one, you know who's, you know who's already forgotten their improv 101 show? Improv 201 students. Like yeah. this is dust. It's dust in the rear view mirror. It's gone. Yeah. It's, like, it's that's exactly it. Like I I have those exact exact memories of like driving home from a improv four hundred one show. Like I mess I stepped too early onto the stage for this beat of the Herald, and right now I can remember those feelings. I can't remember any of those scenes or people. <laughs> 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 and so so yeah, like realize how stupid everything we do is, and it's fine to just make mistakes, you know. And, and like you also have to remember, I think too that like, what the hell is, because because this advice comes from a creator. Like if you're talking about a piece of media, obviously you can critique it all you like. But a lot of these questions are actually geared towards creators, like the process of doing this work. And when you're talking about that, if you're not taking a long view towards your body of work. You're you're missing the point. Of course, a show is going to be bad. You're doing a uh, hundred, doing a thousand, a million of these things. One of like, the, the funniest thing. I'm sorry. I, I no, just go have for a, it. A quick thing. One of the funniest things I've, a teacher has ever said to in a classroom is Eugene Cordero, the one of the best improvisers I've ever seen. One of an incredible actor. He's in a million shows. Uh, in our advanced improv class talked about when people are talking about like feeling bad or about doing bad in scenes, like someone just like had some kind of harsh criticism for him about an improv scene once. And he was relaying the story and he was like, and my response was, yeah, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I just made it up and it wasn't good. So like, <laughs> I don't know what you want from me. I made it up. Yeah. yeah. And again, I think that people, it's, that's so funny. I mean, yeah, like what, what's the standard you're applying to this? Like, I don't that, have a giant TV show uh, staff behind me figuring this out. It's, I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy who did it. And I forgot that one thing. Or, well, I think the, 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 a lot of the stress and panic around this comes from like ego death, right? It comes from yeah. the fact that at a certain point, we can't differentiate like giving a bad public speech at a friend's wedding from like dying. Our brains are just broken. And we're like, if I give a bad speech, huh, I'm going to be dead. And it's like, no, that's not the, the stakes. You, no. We have to lower the stakes. We have to add priority and urgency and <laughs> degrees and nuance to this stuff. You you gotta, because otherwise you'll, you'll make yourself sick. You make yourself miserable. And yeah. there's a, I remember as a teacher, one time, I, I always try to be super encouraging, but I had a class of people that that there was just like a panic setting in for some reason about the class show. And someone asked me, they were like, you know, they were like, okay, but this is gonna happen. And I was like, again, you know, we're let me let me allay all fears. Like we're gonna get to the theater, we're gonna get there 30 minutes early, have some snacks, say hi to each other, like trying to have as little ambiguity as possible. Like everything's going to be great. We're going to do a show. You're going to support each other. And we have, have to a... come up with our team names. Yeah. <laughs> come up with our team names as well. And someone, I like said all of that. And I thought like, cool, now we can move on to like doing rehearsal, doing practice. And a person raised their hand and said, what do we do if we have a bad show? And I just looked at them and I went like, you will feel bad and then go home. You will feel bad and you will go home. And that's it. And there's not any other thing that happens. If you wake up the next day and decide to quit improv, um, that's actually, and I really mean this from the bottom of my heart, totally fine. It's totally fine if you have a great show and decide to quit improv. Nobody has to do this. Maybe you're supposed to be a painter. Maybe you're supposed to do something else. Like, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, if you don't commit yourself 100% to long form improv comedy, you are betraying every artistic. It's like, fine. There's even other arts out there that might, I'm not here to tell you what suits you or doesn't suit you. I'm just here to tell you that if we have a bad show, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna be totally fine. Um, yeah. And at the end of the day, like, it, if this is something you love, you should make peace with doing it badly. If this is something you love, like I love that, yeah. 
like if it's something because there are masters out there like you know I, like I, this is a very bizarre analogy michelangelo has a sculpture or a painting that you've never heard of because it just wasn't as good as the rest of the stuff. <laughs> like it just wasn't that good. It might be better than, it might be okay, but it wasn't as good as like the Sistine Chapel. And that's fine. I'm you pretty got... sure the Sistine Chapel wasn't his first piece of work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. There was some kind of half okay stuff on the way up. But here's the other thing too, that I think is very important as well. Yeah, his early stuff was bad. Also, some of the stuff he made after David or the Sistine Chapel was not as good as David or the he Sistine Chapel. He made some really Chapel. shitty ceilings after that, you know? Like... <laughs> there were some off days. Or let's give credit where it's due. Maybe the Sistine Chapel was just, he was on fire. And it's just like, yeah, man, I've been trying to get back there for a while. I don't know. I kind of went into a fugue state. I don't remember what happened. Uh... So like you gotta be kind to yourself. You gotta be kind to yourself. You're, it's not gonna be the Sistine Chapel every time. And ultimately, you shouldn't look at your life as, good God, if I don't recreate the Sistine Chapel, I'm gonna be toast. It's gotta be, I'm trying to create a body of work that has some Davids and some Sistine mm -hmm. Chapels in it. I'm trying to live a life as a creator that I'm like overall quite proud of. Yeah. And I think that's honestly why it's been a little hard to take the pressure off of DMing because, you know, us as players are out there so much and uh, we get so much positive feedback from that, that it's hard to come in at a lower level skill in, a sim in almost the same exact world. You know, like, it's like when like a stand up tries improv and they don't like it, you know, like just because they don't like flailing at something that's so close to what they're really good at. Oh, homie, when I did Deadeye on NADPOD and I couldn't stop referring to myself in the third person and everybody, where I was like, you see Deadeye, you see him. And people were like, this guy doesn't know how to fucking PC. And I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's like, yeah, a hundred percent. You try your hand at a thing and it's like, regardless of skill level or talent level or even like internal dedication, like uh, uh, there is increasing levels of comfort and my god isn't that kind of the point imagine a skill that you're like out of the gate it's like uh you there will be no room for improvement here there is no <laughs> no no lesson to be learned no growth to be had uh a nightmare <laughs> yes completely um well i love this question um uh, here's a fun question from our friend toe thanks toe um toe asks where are your favorite places to go, parenthetical, online or in the meat space, to collect visual imagery to inspire the weird and wonderful worlds we make? Yeah, visual inspiration. Where do we get it? Mm, I'm sorry, the meat space? <laughs> uh, internet uh, vernacular, uh, meaning the world in which our IRL meat composed bodies associate and interact. The real world, for lack of a better word. I see, I see. Well. Edit that out. Edit that out. <laughs> um, I know. I'm hip. Uh, yeah, it's a really good question. I like, um, you know, right now I'm going into an arc that is like a little water focused and, and it's like probably going to be on a boat for a majority of it. And so like trying to, to I, I'm, I'm on the, I, I'm on the podcast talking about a specific area, so I'm uh, at least having to be within those confines. So I'm like, okay, lakes, lakes that are uh, I have saltwater lakes and a freshwater lake. Uh, I, I started looking into like the kind of Nat Geo space for really cool lakes and started looking at like, um, I think Emily does a really good job with this with like hot boy summer stuff where she looks into like, uh, every description is so um, scientifically accurate uh, about these animals and things that that we would see. Uh, and so that I mean, just nature itself is really inspiring in that way. So like any of those like Blue Planet kind of shows are great for the, the literal world. Uh, and then for vibes, you know, like I think it's just fun to just think of like I, I'm. You know, a sucker for finding a TV show that I like and and a social a social dynamic I like and trying to like emulate something like that. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, TV, movie, book inspiration, I think is really, really huge. I'm a big like genre head where for me, like I often use those as touchstones of like, okay, what's the vibe here? Where it's like, okay, we're gonna do gritty urban horror, you know, underworld, blade. Uh, we're doing that like the 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 vibe is like rain and there, or like we're doing noir, very like, or it's like Sin City, or it's like classic noir, like Reefy Fee or something mm -hmm. like that. Like using those genre cultural touchstones, I think, is a really great way because there's for imagery specifically, I think it's great because genre so often communicates not only a look, but also a tone and a mood and a resonance and things like that. It's so efficient. Like you, you communicate so much. Yeah. Like, uh, Hey, here's another example for plot. Uh, that would be good. Uh, that's an improv scene. So like, uh, we're talking about underworld, maybe, uh, maybe instead of, uh, lichens, they're hot dogs <laughs> and, uh, everything else is the same. And so then it's like for millennia, the hot dogs have uh, and the vampires, the hot yes. dogs and the vampires. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or vampires are um, sodas or something. <laughs> <laughs> Could be good. Could be good. Hey, you know, you make a great point, and that's ultimately honestly that's crown of candy. Uh... <laughs> That's the critical world building we aspire to. Um, uh, uh, no, but there is that funny thing, again, like tone and vibe and genre. But I think that like, the question specifically asked about like, collect visual imagery. Um, I think that there, for me, everything kind of comes back down to what's the thing you're trying to make someone feel, right? If you're looking at something, if you're looking at like Miyazaki's work, which, and that's like a perfect thing of like, oh man, what's more visually inspiring than like mm, Miyazaki yeah. films, right? It's like, what are we always seeing? We're seeing like biplanes and birds and like bays with like sailboats in them and then grass and trees moving in the wind. There's like always wind stuff there. And I can't help but look at all these things that capture the idea of wind and movement. And the fact that when I'm watching Miyazaki movies, which I've been doing, you know, like I used to watch my neighbor Totoro oh, like over and over and over again religiously as a kid. You watch them and your chest just starts to fill up and you like float <laughs> up in your seat. It's just there's a feeling of levity in them. And I go like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like there's like you, a weightlessness to the way characters move and like, uh, yeah, totally. So you go like, okay, if I want my characters to feel this feeling of like boundless adventure and that feeling of thrill that makes your chest feel like it's gonna burst open, I should probably have biplanes and sailboats and wind in the grass. Like there yeah. is weirdly kind of a math of how those things go, uh, go together, right? Um, the degree to which, you know, this is there's a certain degree of like I think people try to avoid the kind of like literary analysis that can be like, well, the director clearly used the imagery of the broken vehicle to symbolize the decay of American blah blah. blah. Like, you know, there is a degree to which like that way lies pretension. However, there's a reason that like noir movies have rain in all of them because rain. Uh, uh, oppresses you. It makes you cold. It pushes you down. You're like, have your shoulders hunched and your hat on. And it feels like the literal world is against you. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So it's like, I think that, that what I look for in that genre stuff is um, if you're looking for visual imagery, um, I think do it with an eye towards what you're trying to make your players feel, right? Yeah, that's great. That's a really great way to say that. I, I, I think like, um, uh, I feel like doing the, like, kind of just almost just two things mash up is a great shortcut to just, like, finding something you find interesting and it feels slightly unique. Uh, you know, like, the, the noir meets blah, you know, like, is a good way to just, like, feel like you're coming up with something that feels a little different than what you've been looking at, uh, 
fully, fully agree. Oh, that's also like classic game, right? Like baseline yeah. reality plus unusual thing. You found something interesting, especially I think one of the fun things from improv as well is take two things that maybe are dissonant or you wouldn't think necessarily go together. And all of a sudden in mashing them up, your logic brain will start to write a story about why it makes sense. And yes. in that you can find incredible world building stuff. Um, that's really, really odd. Yeah, I love that that idea of like the mashup for something. Um, uh, Cause again, like your the logic part of your brain wants to clean up a mess. So if you just take two random things you like that don't go together, you know your brain will find a reason they go together. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a crown of candy was very much that of like these two th like Candyland doesn't go with grim, dark political intrigue, and yet if it did, would it not look something like you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I love that world building advice. Um, uh, with that, because I know that like uh, uh, for rotating heroes in this first arc, we have it's very fun because there's like very classic fantasy stuff in there, but also a lot of like arcano punk, arcano tech, no mission ventures and stuff like that. Um, when you were doing that, like what what did you like in building that world? What was the vibe you kind of clocked onto right away, right? Because there's also like the very expansive forest in that setting, like big magic, but also these very relatable touchstones of like little bits of modernism peeking through. Um, like what were the vibes you were clocking in doing the mashup world building for rotating heroes? I, yeah, that's a good question. I think like, uh, it's fun cause you can like mash two things up here and here and here. So it's like, uh, you know, if you're kind of creating the cross section between two things, like they, they, that could be, uh, there could be many opportunities for that. But, uh, and what I found interesting and in sort of just planning the world overall, uh, was just like, yeah, more, more of a like, uh, foresty dense, like, uh, uh, wildernessy campaign was an was an idea I had, and then when I was thinking about that more thoroughly, I was like, I was thinking of the like obelisk like stuff, um, but I also was self conscious about running a wilderness campaign that felt like it could go anywhere immediately. I was like, well, let's just do something in there, and then uh, that made me in planning that town that has this obelisk that landed there and uh, wanting wanting that to fit in with this world um, to make it make sense to me. I was like, well, this could be like literally when I went to Iceland and this, this, like this country just suddenly has tourism. What is that like? Uh, and uh, you know, like that you can just like find what the relatable touchstones are to you as you go. And like, yeah, like it was just fun to me that this, ob this town had an obelisk. I didn't know what it would, would necessarily be like at first and get, you know, gave myself the space to figure that out in the planning stages, if that makes sense. I love that. And it's great too. I think taking a real thing like, oh, look at like the, the volcano tourism in Iceland. That's a real yeah. thing. You can look up imagery for that. And then just again, following that logic and you add a degree of the fantastical to it because it's this giant obelisk that is you know, mm. huge magical artifact. But it's very cool to be able to follow some real world logic here and there uh, to bring that verisimilitude. Like, yes, there's some wild giant whirlpool out in the ocean devouring everything, mm. but... <laughs> People got to sail ships. So how are we, yeah. how are we getting around that whirlpool how gang? How do we do it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> are people surfing in there? <laughs> oh, damn. That, there's, That's there's, rad. <laughs> I smell arc number three, baby. Um, <laughs> arc number two. Let's get this go. <laughs> Throwing it out. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, oh, here's a, here's a fun little question. Um, uh, Sheepdog asks, I noticed that when I run things, my players hate shopping, but feel like it has to be done. I noticed that D20 and NADPOD don't really get into economy or shopping. How do you avoid it or make it, make it meaningful instead of monotonous? Is it worth avoiding? Um, I've answered similar questions to this before, but uh, uh, Zach, as you're launching out into rotating heroes, um, uh, like treasure, uh, uh, economy, spending money, buying stuff, does that figure into your into your heroic imagination a lot, or are you kind of not into doing that in Rotating Heroes? So that's interesting that they ask that, because 
coming from like playing a lot of like Final Fantasy games, etc., like that was very much what I assumed D and D would be like. And then playing D and D with you, uh, really not in the picture at all for the most part. Uh, and I was like, that kind of made me re rethink my relationship to that. And the more I think about it, like it is a lot. Of, you're dedicating a if you find it important, you end up having to dedicate a lot of time to it. And so, yeah, it's just a, it's a judgment for yourself of if that is that interesting to you. <laughs> like for how frequent infrequently our home game is played, if whenever we went back, we spent three hours shopping and then we played again six months later or whatever. I don't think that's a great use of my time uh, in that yeah. world. And so, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's necessarily necessary. And honestly, like and a lot of times can take like, depending on your world can take the like intrigue and a sense of adventure and whimsy out of it. If it's like literally at a store. Yeah. Well, here's the, so here's what it comes down to, right? Very, when you're talking about economy in D and D, like obviously economy in final fantasy works very differently. Final Fantasy is not really, you are not uh, performing a character in Final Fantasy, right? Yeah. Uh, the, there's a story, but you're not, you're not, you're not literally embodying Cloud Strife, right? So yeah. there's an element to, to D&D where I think, econ look, in 3.5, at the very least, magic items had gold piece values. In 5e, they don't even put a value next, they just put a rarity. So it's like, give them out if you want or don't. So there's literally no way that magic items interact with the economy in 5e. They don't, they don't have a set price, which immediately puts you in this position of sort of being like, okay, well, the only, the only like material goods that really matter past level X are magic items. And mm -hmm. if that's not part of the economy, as is, and this is the issue you find yourself in, right? Most genres that I'm interested in playing in get broken if there's a sword store that sells magic swords, <laughs> right? And that is that is funny. Like going back to Final Fantasy, it's like so many people talk about buying, like this store sells lightning and like <laughs> lightning materia. And then like all these people are like, you'll pass people talking about material. You can see no one using this stuff. Like it has no, no effect on anyone else's life. So to like for D and D where it like has to have implications, like it just, it would be a lot to figure out. How much, how much is Phoenix down in the average store? Like 300 gil, 500 gil, It's like thousand? one of the first things you can buy. It's just one to... of the first things you can buy and it brings people back from the dead. What would that do to the world? It doesn't make, and <laughs> and for death to be such a big factor, like there's so many iconic deaths in that series. And it's like, so I just don't, what is the math here? Cause yeah, couldn't like you... I just watched my friend die in a cut scene. I have 99 <laughs> vials of a thing that brings people back from the dead. I am maxed out. But again, you can go into Final Fantasy and also be like, how many like how many potions are you carrying? Oh, a couple thousand. How are you walking? How are you walking <laughs> right now? You're how are you not? In any case, with, this is all very well trod territory. But the point is that nothing for this type of D and D that I'm interested in playing, mostly things are mythological. The idea that. And that goes across genre. If your genre is mythological, if you're doing, like imagine a superhero thing where Captain America gets his shield back and is like, oh, I'm gonna sell this and a couple other things to get an even better shield called like Ultra Dementor shield and that shield. And you're like, no, it's your one, it's your one shield. You have to keep it. Like, And the first store you went to had the money to buy this? Yeah, yeah like I, I, <laughs> Some pawn shop is like, oh yeah, I got forty billion dollars to buy this unique huh. fucking, you know, vibranium shield. Insane, right? Um, so yeah, I think totally within that. For me, the problem with economy is it usually breaks genre. It's not about whether or not it's boring. It just breaks genre. I don't want you to be able to buy cool magical shit. If you get magical shit, like Inigo Montoya's sword should be his dad's sword. Captain America's shield has a story behind it. Even Iron Man who like churns through suits still builds them all and knows how they work. Like all of this shit should not be a factor of you threw some cash down, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
on top of that, the, the whole shopping thing as well is this. I think shopping needs to confirm genre and only then is it interesting. Meaning you're running some really low magic maritime pirate adventure. Yeah, then cash matters, right? Like every like we're actually keeping track of rations, like we're we're keeping track of what it costs you to eat during the day. Um we're we're keeping track of of like economy really well. Like where do you live? Do you have a house? How are you going to pay down your debt? Like that can be fun, but it's got to be the kind of world like it, the person it really matters about how big your lens is. Like that that is, it can be really, really interesting, or it just can be not at all. <laughs> if if Patrick Rothfuss, who's an amazing D&D player in his own right, but who wrote The Name of the Wind, which is an incredible fantasy book, fundamentally about a brilliant, genius polymath wizard who is absolutely fucked because he was born poor. He was, and he just broke. And it goes through, doesn't matter how good at magic I am, doesn't matter how clever I am, I live in debt. I don't know where my next paycheck's coming from. I've got to scramble to find money. Playing in his world with economy would be incredible because it confirms the genre. It's what the story is about. But if it's not what your story is about, like Zach is saying, like, is it really worth your time? If it's not what your most rangers and like druids early, early on, almost right away, uh, can forage food for them and a bunch of other people. D&D doesn't have a, a real mechanic in it for like it being uncomfortable to sleep in the woods. It's assumed that you just do that and it's fine. If you made me, Brendan Lee Mulligan, sleep in the woods for a week, I'd be like, how do I get a damn apartment? You know, like <laughs> this fucking- I've lost my mind. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. done. I absolutely need a bed. Even the life of like an adventure with a lot of money of like sleeping in inns all the time. Part of the escapism of D&D &D is you never stay in the same place twice. And that doesn't make you like wildly depressed. Like it would make me depressed if I was constantly in a new tavern. I'd be like, God, I absolutely got to go home. Um, but th that's part of the escapism. It's part of the fantasy. Um, I think that, and, and the other big problem with economy is even if you are in a game with economy, you're in that maritime pirate game that like gold pieces really matter. What the hell happens when your wizard becomes like even fifth level? Very quickly, magic makes it so that like how are how are you ever running out of work? Yeah. You can you can cast like stone shape a couple times a day. How does the local lord not hire you to completely reinvent his crumbling castle and give you more go like it yeah. doesn't you know. So like it's, this is this gets into the whole Harry Potter thing of like how the hell are the Weasleys poor? They know magic. Why is your shit all dirty and busted? You know magic. Um, your house is fucked, guys. <laughs> Figure it out. Take it out. half a day. <laughs> Four hours would do wonders here. I know you know the spell. Um, uh, incredible. Um, let's see here. Um, but, but, um, we got more questions. Uh, uh, let's see here. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Um, this one, uh, uh, is from, uh, Rikun and Roland. Thank you, Rikun and Roland. Um, how do you handle players at the table who don't seem to be invested in defeating the BBEG, AKA big, bad, evil guy. How do you deal with this as a fellow player if it seems the other PC doesn't care about anything? Oh no, apathetic player. Um, uh, yeah, how do you deal with uh, a player at your table who doesn't appear to be invested in stuff or caring? Did you say as a player? Yeah, as a player. So I guess as DM or or player. The question is asking is as a player. Um, well, I feel like if if you're a player and you happen to notice someone's lack of investment or whatever, and it's not just like that day they were off and it's an ongoing thing. I mean, in character, you could you could talk to that character and and you know push them to say what they care about, and uh, you know like even if the if it's like I care about like you know 
getting drunk and you know like being the cool guy in the town or whatever it's like okay we'll see you later because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's like they, they, even if they're like they feel detached from what the big bad guy is they hopefully don't feel detached from the other players and i think that's where you find a lot of like more chaotic or more neutral feeling characters investments come from in the things i've seen it's like they they have to care about the people around them at least that's basically what it comes down to is there there's a degree of the answer to this question varies depending on how acute the situation is because on the one hand a player not caring could be a sign of disengagement because some character need is not being met in which case i think zach's advice of like reach out to them maybe maybe there's a part of the campaign that's not being explored that would really engage this person and bring them out um but also ultimately it's kind of the job of the PCs to care. Like in a real way, it's, it's, you don't need to care about every single aspect of the campaign, but it is like the central core plot. I think that this could come down to either the, maybe the player is stuck with a character that um, is, is for some reason or other, they're trying to be honest to the character and not finding a key in for their character to get invested. Or you could just have like, a compatibility issue with that player. Like, I think some people strike out to try and play D&D, &D, but play it in a way where their character is aloof or unbothered, which is frankly, I think down that road lies death. I think, like we say in improv all the time that like apathy is the one character choice that just doesn't work for a scene. Like you can't be bored in an improv scene. Um, but again, not knowing the specifics, there's different answers depending on what's really going on there. So the one overall answer is probably communication. Like yeah. figure out what's really going on there. Um, although that can be challenging. Um, We're spoiled with their table, I gotta tell you. I know, right? I know. I, uh, we we got. It. It's very nice to have a bunch of people that can make strong character choices, but are definitely going to be invested. And by the way, I think. Like we were talking about before, we were talking about giving people their spotlight moments. I love when characters are invested in other characters' spotlight moments. Like again, in like the big scene that Iga had in the dungeons of her sort of ancestral castle, um, we watched Kingston again give her a lot of space. But then when she came out of it and talked to Kingston, he had very clearly been paying attention and had thoughts and feelings about what he had witnessed. Like. That's the thing. That's kind of the thing I, from again, I haven't PC'd that much in the last couple of years, but like playing Dead Eye and Mad Pod, the degree to which Emily immediately cared about what was going on with Dead Eye, it mm. felt like a drug of like, oh my God, another player is like invested in what's going on with me. Holy shit. I, you know, that didn't have to be that way. Yeah, and, and that, like, and just having that kind of conversation or dynamic and, you know, no spoilers, but, like, that makes that that whole story, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, this one comes to us from Lena. Thank you, Lena. Um, do you have any interesting dice origin stories? Any interesting dice origin stories? Um, I don't have it on me, but... Uh, I think it's in my closet somewhere. I have some dice, but I have a dice that a, a, a little D20 that Brennan gave me at the end of our first season of fantasy high. That was from, I believe your first, your collection of dice that you've had for since you were a kid. And it's probably the sweetest, uh, the, the sweetest, the sweetest die I have. Oh, if I'm ranking them by sweetness. Another oh. one would be that before our live show in New York, uh, the one, you know, hopefully one day we'll get to be out in public again and do things like that again. Uh, ran into some uh, folks on the street who were there for the the show when I I think I had like an overnight flight to mm -hmm. New York. I got on every wrong train or whatever. Uh, we don't have to talk about that too much, but <laughs> I. <laughs> I just like went to check out the venue because I was staying kind of nearby and I was like I had literally nothing to do and it was like nine in the morning, uh, and happened after I got breakfast and was in the area, I happened to run into two people who were like there for the show and one of them had get, had dice for everybody and uh, they gave me some dice and rolled a rolled a nat twenty with that die for that show. Oh, 
incredible. So, very sick. Oh, very, very sick. That is wonderful. Um, uh, yes, I'm giving the those the 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 dice for uh, the cast after that for the, like the seven of us was very very sweet. Yeah, some ancestral dice that I'd had since I was ten years old. So I'm like of the most trusty and stalwart d20s there. Um, uh, the the dice origin stories like. I am very blessed with a, a large collection of dice that have been given from friends and loved ones. Um, I had, the one I can think of off the top of my head is a little jade green plastic chess X D20 that my brother Griff first gave me. That is always a go-to. Um, uh, the, the A very, very sweet D20 from my brother uh, that I, again, have had since I was... A lad of but 10 years of age. Have you ever made dice? I never have. have. I've never made dice. I'm curious dice. to try it. I've, you know, it seems fun. I have some friends that are in the dice making game. It's very, very cool. I have uh, uh, some uh, various dice from around um, uh, that are, it's it's a cool, it's a cool industry. Some there's like premium dice makers out there. Um, uh, they're, they're doing some cool stuff. Um, and also have my wonderful, as we all do, our wonderful dice boxes that were made for us for Unsleeping City by Siobhan Thompson. Yes, that's very nice as well. Uh, very, very nice. They're I not have... dice, though, so I don't know. <laughs> the <qualifies> the... <laughs> um, uh, hell yeah. Um, uh, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, uh, uh, this one's from Smartass Jacob. Thanks, Smartass Jacob. I'm running a home campaign for close to a year now, and I'm getting overwhelmed by having to keep track of everything. Mythology, plot, developments, interactions. Any tips for managing an ever-expanding story and cast of characters? Thanks for all the content. Mm. Uh, yeah, managing campaign notes. Uh, uh, for rotating heroes, having now come to sort of the conclusion of the first arc, wh where do you, do you have like one central thing or do you have a couple different resources you use to keep track of the campaign? So for that, like organization has always been my probably least strong suit in my life. Uh, so going into it, a big challenge for DMing for me was like figuring that stuff out. And it's still a process for me. Um, I have been using an app called Notion that is sort of a note-taking kind of database-y site. And they have a lot of good templates that are available that you like, if you go to like a website or someone makes one themselves, I think there might be some D&D &D ones out there that you cool. click on and it, and it creates like DMing templates. Like here's the, you know, it like breaks it up with like, uh, these are the magic items. These are the headings for different types of scenes and things like that. Um, so it kind of gives you like a worksheet to go off of. Yeah. I find that kind of thing helpful and you can tailor them to, you know, customize them fully yourself. I found that to be helpful and I would, I'd be lying if I said that was fully organized. <laughs> and I, I think the biggest thing that helps me keep track of it is editing the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, uh, no, very much the same way. I've moved almost everything digital. Used to have index cards. Even in like early seasons of Dimension 20, I was still, I had index cards. I had other stuff like that. Now, especially for 5E, my, my old 3.5 campaign is still somewhat analog. But for a 5E campaign now, it's like character sheets on D&D Beyond. I build my encounters there. I build my magic items there. Build monster stat blocks there. Um, if we're if I'm not doing theater of the mind, we'll do. And obviously, pandemic has made all of this even more wild. But we'll do like roll twenty. Back in back in physical days, I would still have a physical battle mat with markers and miniatures and things like that. Um, but um, so tabletop will be on roll twenty. Dice rolling will happen on roll twenty. Um, character sheets and stat blocks, magic items, which will live on D&D &D Beyond. And then for actual campaign notes, be it, you know, names, it's like names, plot, uh, uh, session notes of like describing, like describing what actually happened. Um, uh, uh, ba -ba -ba. Um, we would actually have like, I'll, I'll usually have Google Docs because it's just the command find function and I can hyperlink things on D&D &D Beyond. So I can like, yeah. 
you know, it's it's easy to have those things open. And then just like a zillion tabs. And then what I'll also usually have like a jump calculator open for the jump skill. That'll be my one, the one thing that hasn't been folded into <laughs> everything else. I'll just have a jump calculator open. Um, uh, uh, When's Casio gonna make a jump calculator, you know? Uh, hey, Casio, <laughs> knock, knock, knock. The fans are hungry for a jump calculator. Um, no, jump is hard. And it's one of the last few things that's sort of in there that's uh, challenging. Um, uh, especially back in the day, I remember our home game, uh, Zyarf OC Spray, Werewolf Monk, very good at jumping. Some very wild yeah, jumps in there. You gave him a, a staff that can double his jump or something like that. <laughs> Still one of the coolest magic items I think yes, I've ever... absolutely rules. <laughs> I don't know if I have that little thing. <gasps> Do you have John Wolf's? Oh, this is such a treat for the fans to get to see. A uh, uh, friend of the I show, John Wolf, shout it. out to John. Hold on. Oh, made this incredibly sweet. I got I, I I I can show you this right now. We got time for this, right? We got time, baby. Let's do a, let's do a little a fun little stinger okay. here at the end. So hand wraps of the moon or the magic item I got for a little secret Santa gift from our buddy John Wolf. I, I don't know if you just said all of this while I wasn't sitting here. Um so it's like it has there it can do four different things. And mm -hmm. so John made this amazing cube that can show you this is him half werewolf, half man. Uh, and then each of the different things, like this is one version of it. Uh, I can't see what it says. Uh, this is another version of it. Uh, this, <laughs> this is a different version of it. It's incredible. has all their abilities and stuff on it. Yeah, it was like so. It's like this this moon based magic item. It's a transforming monk weapon because you're a werewolf monk, and it's like it's there's five it's five kind of like weapons that it becomes that change the like stance and fighting style and different abilities that are associated with the phases of the moon. So like new moon are kind of like just like the hand wrapping sort of claws on them, and then it goes to I think it's like crescent is the is war fans. Um, then we got it, Crescent, Full Moon, we got the, the Gibbous Moon, um, yes. we got a couple of different guys in here. It's it's so cool. Ugh. Best magic item I've ever gotten. <laughs> I do. I like that one a lot. Um, well, that's a very dope note for us to, to end on, uh, uh, making sick magic items. And imagine if you had bought that in a store. I don't think so. No way. No way. <laughs> Get out of here. Uh, many, many thanks to Mr. Zach Oyama uh, uh, for coming in and uh, talking to us today, all that stuff. Zach, how did, us, uh, how did we get these people to go and watch Rotating Heroes right now? Where do they find you? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. You know, it's we're on patreon.com slash Rotating Heroes pod uh, if you want to be up to date on it. But if you just want to check it out, it's in the, I think the whole first arc will be on the NADPOD feed. They've been very helpful and nice to me about this. And I've been hosting those episodes like monthly, I think. So um, yeah, that'll slowly roll out over there. But if you want to hear the talkbacks and all the uh, episodes uh, when they come out, the, check out the Patreon. Hell yeah. Zach, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, for everyone watching at home, thank you. This has been Adventuring Academy and we will catch you next time. Ciao.